Hi everyone, I'm Heather Black, CEO of Supermums, and I teach the Consultancy Skills course, where I help Salesforce admins and Salesforce consultants upskill in a whole range of skills to help them feel confident managing Salesforce projects. Now I'm delivering some bite-sized little training sessions to just unpack a little bit about what we cover in the course. And today's bite-sized session is about how to estimate your time and budget on a Salesforce project. So I'm gonna give you some key things to take away and think through so you can start costing it out. And what we provide on our course is our, it's actually a spreadsheet template that you can fill in um, and it helps calculate exactly how long things are going to take. And I did this because I had to grow a team of consultants beneath me when I was running a Salesforce consultancy. And we all had to have a uniform approach to costing out projects. So let me take you through some of the key methodologies here. So the first thing is to um, discuss with a client whether you're doing an agile or waterfall project methodology. The way that you price and cost things um, will differ to some degree. At the end of the day, things still take the same amount of time, but agreeing how you, whether you want a fixed price up front for delivering a fixed number of deliverables or whether you are agreeing a budget and deciding on what gets built throughout the process varies depending on whether it's agile or waterfall. So many people train up in agile project management, um, but still you can be in that situation with a client where you'll deliver in one way or another way. And I've certainly found that with many of the clients that I've worked with. So understanding both, being adaptable to both, will really um, be beneficial for you. We deliver training on the agile project management methodology at Supermums within our course. Now, the second thing to think about is how many projects are you costing up? And so as part of a business analysis process, or even actually that proposal stage, you're actually wanting to delve into, well, how many different things do I need to do a design process around? Because quite often, if you've got a separate design process, you're going to have a separate build, separate user testing and a separate training. So even if you're just implementing Salesforce for a sales team, a sales team could consist of a number of teams that have customer different team have different customers and different things that they're selling and so if you're implementing sales cloud there might still be four or five different design workshops there therefore might be um, the following life cycle elements where you're still then having to deliver a build a user testing and training for those different teams even within like one sales department so get really clear with a client around how many different types of sales processes are there i.e. how many different customers or products they're selling and are there nuances in those ways that they're being, the, the way the system will need to be built. So identify how many different projects there are which will need the full project lifecycle implementation. So let's talk through that full project lifecycle implementation. Now there's always um, the, the onboarding approach, there's design, you've got build, you've got then user testing, training, offboarding and the project management. So I'm going to go through each of these things in more detail. These are all the elements that you want to think about. And quite often, some of these can get missed out, which means that you go over time and over budget. So going through looking at onboarding, onboarding is really important to make sure you all set off the project, kick off the project on the right foot. Now, what are onboarding tasks? I came up with about 12 different onboarding tasks that I would then get checked off with customers to make sure we've done everything properly. So these things will include project planning, communicating the process with the customer so they all understand what's gonna happen over what time period. It might include different preparation support, making sure they've got the right documents and templates to complete. It might mean acquiring licenses. Again, there's a range of things that you need to do upfront, which is all billable to a time and a time and money on a project so make sure you've got those things in place then you move through to the actual design phase now in a design phase you'll we would highly recommend that you do a business analysis preparation workshop this is a pre-discover workshop really where you're explaining to the client what the design process entails what information they need to get ready you might be doing show and tells of a system because if you're in a position where you're asking them what reports and dashboards they need you might want to show them the reports and dashboards and what the examples are so that it brings it to life for them particularly important for, for visual learners so quite often you'll do that preparation workshop with them to say look we're going to come in and do a full-on design workshop with you in three weeks time this is what we need to get, this is what you will need to get ready for that workshop. And that's very important because quite often if you don't do that, you'll do a design workshop and they won't have that information to hand. 
Now, also what you can do to help them get ready for a design workshop is give them a, a business analysis script or questionnaire to fill in to get them to think through what it is and to write it down on paper. And they can send those questionnaires back to you in advance. And so you then spend some time digesting them and seeing what they've written in advance of that workshop. All of that takes time and all of that needs to be completed. But what it means is that everybody's prepared for that design workshop. So you're going to keep things on budget. Quite often, if that hasn't been done, and this is from first hand experience, is you'll do the design workshop. They don't have the information in place. Then you're scrapping around trying to agree additional design time because you'll need additional time afterwards because they haven't got things into place. So be prepared. Put all those milestones in place in advance. Um, you know, make them aware that if they haven't got this information ready, that it might require more design budget afterwards. So always have that as a safeguard as well. Now, you've then got the time delivering a workshop. Again, if that's virtual or physical, you need to calculate that time in, particularly if you're traveling on site as well. And then you need the time to write up requirements. And we'll talk, there's a separate bite-sized video I've done on what documents you would produce. So you can watch that on YouTube. Um, but the other key element here that people sort of get a bit worried about is do I charge for researching solutions? Absolutely. As a Salesforce professional, you are tasked with finding the right solution to their problems. And that's researching third party apps. So you might need to you know, look at different third party apps, create a matrix around them, present them back to the client. All of that needs to be costed into this solution because it's for this client. It's not knowledge that you would be expected to have in your head and to know because there's millions of apps out there. You know, so every time you're researching a solution and this could be a native Salesforce solution or a third party app one, that is time that needs to be costed into this. So if you are aware in advance that they need this, great. If not, if you're working on an agile methodology, then all of this needs to be packaged into this design time. Now, moving through to implementation, this is sometimes actually sometimes the, the easier thing to implement or cost out. Um, what I produced for our team is that we had a spreadsheet with all the different kind of things that you might be building. And so say, for example, you've mapped out your workbook, which is another sort of document you want to be producing. You can look at that workbook and go, OK, we've got 300 fields to build here. We've got 10 reports to build. We've got 20 email templates. And what you can do is easily just put that in a spreadsheet and start calculating how long those things will need to take. Now, some email templates can take longer than others. Um, some formulas can take a lot longer than others. So you need to have that awareness of, of what the complexity is of some of these aspects and to really cost out how much time the system is going to take to build. So you can agree that with the client, prioritize things in that build because you might cost out all of the build of all the requirements they've done. And then they'll say to you, actually, can we prioritize these key things first? So let's prioritize the build of these objects and these email templates and these workflows. And then that will obviously reduce the time and effort required initially. They can then move down their agile project management priorities list as, as they deem fit. So you want that clarity around how long things are going to take so they can really understand it and prioritize accordingly. Now, moving through to user testing, um, with Agile, you'd be doing user testing every week, potentially. This is where you're taking them through the system. They're trying it out. You would put them in a sandbox. You might do some test data. You might do a demo for them first. You put together some user testing scripts that they can work through and, and walk through that with them, because this is a key point where they're testing out the system to see if it works in the way they anticipate. Now, at this point, they are then also going to identify things that need changes. So then you need that budget for those change requests to keep iterating the system to get it to a point that they are happy with it as a minimal viable product and beyond. And then you'll have repeat testing because you need to kind of keep going through this cycle to the point they're like, yeah, right, this is ready to roll out for the team. So always budget in time for doing proper user testing to make sure it's right. There's nothing worse than rolling out a system to a team that is not correct. Um, because it hasn't been tested properly. And then finally, make sure you don't compromise on training time. Again, I've done another bite-sized session on how to effectively deliver a five-star training strategy. So go and check out that video on YouTube as well. There's a lot of things that you want to include in a training strategy. And this is a key point where you're getting people very enthused and engaged and adopting the system. And it's about helping maintain the system long term because they've got to use the system and that's what makes it successful. So you don't want to prioritize some build and compromise on training. And I have seen that happen 
um, often. So make sure that the client or the team that you're working with understand how important it is to get a great training strategy in place, to spend time on that training strategy and not to compromise on it. Now, things that you might want to consider for your training strategy is um, doing a great demo, again, setting up sandboxes, having a presentation to deliver to them as part of a live training, having videos that can be stored, whether it's recording the live training you're doing or creating mini videos. You might want to create a manual for this client. Maybe that's what they want. You would deliver the in-situ training. You might develop those training scripts, which are similar to your user testing scripts, similar things, but this would be for the rollout of the system. And so there's a lot of things that you can include in that training time. As I say, really recommend you go and watch the other bite-sized training on how to create a, a, an effective training strategy for your users. So don't compromise on that element is all I'd say. Then number nine is offboarding. And offboarding is a very important element because if you don't offboard a customer properly, what it can mean is that they're there coming back on being reliant on you and not maintaining their system going forward. So you need to spend some of the time and budget making sure that there's an internal Salesforce admin that knows what they're doing, they know how the system works, they know where to go and get support. You've potentially offered them advanced support, which might be with yourself as a consultant, with a consultancy or, um, SI, or even with Salesforce. Do they know where to go to aftercare support? Do they know about the Salesforce Ohana? Do they know about Trailhead? You know, really helping make sure that they are set up for success. And equally, you can also help them set up a support desk of their own. So if their end users are needing support with Salesforce, they know how to log a case, ask for support, and set them up in, in the right way. All of that is paramount because if you don't offboard a customer, as I say, they might be left with a system that isn't managed or maintained. You know, they don't know how to then sort of maintain it going forward and they feel um, that they haven't got the confidence and a bit left in the lurch, if you like. So all of those different aspects are so important. And then overarching all of this is a project management time. You need to be able to budget for those client communications that you're having back and forth. That might be a daily um, stand up that you're having with the client. So you can ask them questions, keep them informed, keep the momentum going. It might be about your internal communication if there's more than one of you working on this system. It might be your time using a Salesforce project management system. So you might use a project management system to log your time, to log the requirements, to log updates, to communicate with customers. Typically project management time can be up to 10% of an overall budget of a project. So be aware that all of that project management time also needs to be included in your budget too. So Salesforce projects do take time and energy to implement. Try not to cost, you know, cut corners on those things because ultimately it's where a project and a system can fail if you cut these corners. It's better to be really upfront with a client and manage a whole project lifecycle around a specific build of a project um, rather than try and build everything and miss all those other components out, which it can be one of the, the situations that can happen. So do factor in all of those things. Now, if you found this really useful for you, then you might want to learn more on our consultancy skills course. Do come and find out more. Say follow us on YouTube as well, because we have some other bite-sized videos on there that will teach you other tips that you can apply straight away today. So I hope you've enjoyed that. We'd love to hear your feedback and comments. Thank you for, so much for listening today, and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye.